passion is amazing to start something interesting right so if you are not passionate you would not start something interesting but i think there is a lot more things than passion which is required to sustain it over time one of my most overused quote is uh, you know if you want to do what you love you have to love what you do there is a time when you will need to realize that when you run a business or a enterprise it's done for customers so however passionate you are about something you will have to do things that the customers want welcome back my dear listeners this is inspire someone today bringing to you inspirers across a wide spectrum of our society i'm truly happy and honored to have this inspirer joining us on this episode proudly i can call that somebody from my own home state for the beautiful state of karnataka he is somebody who is turning views into breathtaking moments understands a bit more about passion more deeply than anybody else an award winning wildlife uh, photographer it's an absolute joy to have jayan sharma on inspire someone today jayan welcome to the show thank you thank you very much for having me so sitting back here in 2023 jayan if you were to kind of from a photographer's lens take a look back what are the high points that you have seen in terms of your own journey what are some of the memorable shots that you would want to kind of go back and uh, don't do anything but just keep looking at those uh, images and feel very proud of uh, what you have done yeah it's going to be difficult to choose a few from so many amazing experiences that i have had i think about 10 years ago i discovered my passion for the arctic so also the antarctic so in in short the polar regions so i think now after uh, 10 plus years of going there and maybe a dozen expeditions so far i think polar bears and penguins in the polar regions is something that excites me the most so i have a lot of memories of that apart from of course the most exciting you know african adventures big cats hunts you know a lot of things that we see in places like uh, kenya tanzania botswana and things like that so i have had a lot of great wildlife encounters in my life very difficult to choose one or two but i can remember a few beautiful moments that i've had in my life and it's a wonderful dichotomy nobody better than a photographer like you to kind of uh, unpeel that is lot many times when we take pictures the thing running on the mind is okay i need to send this to so and so or i need to put it on say the social media platforms and also we are at a time in the world where we are also talking about mindfulness being in the moment being present so my question to you is when you're taking these uh, pictures when you're kind of enjoying the nature enjoying the beauty of uh, what you see around and at the same time you have these thoughts saying that i need to kind of share it with the world how do you bring in that balance how do you kind of practice being present in such kind of moments hey that's an amazing uh, question i'm uh, very sure of the answer i'm giving because i've had a lot of thinking to do on this topic past myself so just to remind myself and maybe introduce it to all your listeners i am first a nature lover and just to you know talk about my background i fell in love with nature first even though photography was family business my dad is a photographer i was born and brought up in a studio I played hide and seek in the dark room but i was not at all passionate about photography and i perhaps i'm still not passionate about photography i am passionate about nature and wildlife so i have made this very strong agreement with myself that i am taking pictures not for myself at all uh, it's a very clear statement that i'm making i take pictures only for an audience if it is for myself i would rather watch what i'm seeing and enjoy it through my naked eyes but since i have uh, this role of a photographer i happen to play the role of a photographer when i am taking a camera i consider that as a distraction from my own enjoyment and i'm willing to do that only if i can share that pleasure with hundreds of people otherwise if it's only for myself i wouldn't even you know take pictures i feel so for me if there is some opportunity where i have to decide whether should i take the photo or enjoy the moment that means i'm very clear why i'm doing that so most of the times i take pictures because i'm very sure this is worth showing to people it also makes my benchmark of good photography increase because if there is a you know opportunity where sometimes 
photography is not going to be great because light is not good or the animal is in a bush. But nevertheless, if the subject is exotic, beautiful, it can be a pleasure to the eyes, maybe not translate into good photos. So in that case, I never touch my camera. I enjoy what I'm seeing. And if I touch my camera, I better make a photo which is good and artistic and which is worth showing. That's the clarity I have. That's wonderful clarity. Is it developed over a period of time through your photography skills or is it something that you kind of mindfully practice it saying that this is how I draw the boundaries? Yeah, I mean, I started photography very early and I realized something very important, right? One is, what is the point of taking photos which are not exotic, special, great, artistic, and at the same time, you not enjoying the moment and being engrossed in the aperture, shutter speed, ISO, nonsense all the time. And then it's useless pictures which will sit in your hard disk and make no noise in the world. Like they're not going to be awarded. They're not going to be appreciated by people. They are just di digital junk. And are you going to sacrifice your pleasure of seeing something and, you know, engrossing your, yourself into that? Uh, for the sake of making these kind of digital junk is what I feel strongly. So if I'm making a junk photo, I rather enjoy it through my eyes. If I feel there is a great opportunity, I make use of the camera and do that. So over time, I have matured. Earlier, I used to click kind of pictures as well. But I realized it's only filling up my hard disk and nothing else. Masterpiece is for the masters. Share beauty is for your own eyes. The beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Super. And uh, again, that kind of stems into another rampant conversation topic that is out there is finding your passion. I'm sure you would have heard lot many people telling you, looking at your uh, pictures, saying that, man, I would love to do something like what you're doing. That's my passion kind of stuff. So, and I'm sure this is also something that you do for a living. So it's just not passion for the sake of passion, but that passion is also fueling you. Can you help our listeners to differentiate between identifying passion, the perils of pursuing passion and sustaining passion? So there are three elements from what I see. It is it's just not passion for the sake of passion, but about how do you keep it alive? How do you keep it sustaining? And how do you kind of also not make it like a, like a money mentoring unit, but rather enjoy for the sake of enjoying? How do you kind of keep the passion going? How do you sustain the passion? And what are the perils of following your passion? So again, I have had the fortune of uh, answering this question a few times. So every time somebody asks me this question, I, you know, put myself in the context of thinking about this very well. I think passion is amazing to start something interesting, right? So if you're not passionate, you would not start something interesting. But I think there is a lot more things than passion, which is required to sustain it over time like in my case i used to be passionate about nature which is why i started traveling out i picked up the camera i started doing long hours of photography and travel that was great to begin with but i think like any romantic affair like you know many of us want to learn music want to learn painting want to do so many things when you want to do it in the beginning because you're excited it's very interesting but over time we will realize a few not so nice things about field of uh, pursuit for that matter and if you want to sustain that, I think only passion is not enough. There needs to be a little more than that. For example, you should have rationale. You should have, if you want to convert your passion into a business, you need to have business sense. You need to see the gains in money. You need to see a lot of other success than just quenching your thirst of creativity and, you know, being passionate about something, I feel. So in my case, my background in what I was doing as a professional helped. So I could actually use my passion as a fuel, but there were a lot of other nuts and bolts to, you know, operate to kind of do what I'm doing. And again, in that same vein, Jayan, what would be your wisdom sharing to people dreaming to follow their passion? I'm sure the path was not easy. And it's very easy to kind of say that, okay, follow your passion. That doesn't mean that you wrap up everything overnight and go behind what you're passionate about. So from your own journey, what wisdom would you allow to share with business? I remember what my father told me when I was just about to embark journey. And, and uh, he told me in uh, Kannada, my mother tongue, that, you know, let's say you're traveling on this boat for a while now. Let's say I was a techie eight, nine years into the IT industry. I was a user experience designer. And suddenly I win an award and that seems like a delimiter. And I come back home and say, now I'm a wildlife photographer. I want to change my career. To be honest, it seems very 
immature today to do that. Back then, uh, there was still some scope because there was very few people who were doing this. But I think my father told me a very important thing that I'd like to pass on to your listeners as well. He told me, you know, Magu, when you're on one boat traveling and you're talking about jumping onto the other boat just next to you, be careful, put one foot on the other boat and make sure you're stable. And once you feel you're grounded well on that other boat, then lift your leg from this boat and transfer your entire weight to the other boat. Otherwise, if you jump from here to there, you might end up in the middle and drown, which is a very philosophical, you know, way of telling me that, you know, just don't quit and jump on the next week and try it for a bit and see if it shows some signs of scalability, sustainability, and then you quit what you're doing. I see a lot of people who probably don't do that. They decide next quarter they are changing their profession to a chef or a photographer or a filmmaker or whatever. And uh, nine out of 10 times I see them going back to another job in three months or six months. And you do a lot of classes. We'll talk about it, about professional photography. But my question here is, is being professional photographer a lucrative and is lucrative and is it very expensive? Depends on what genre of photography somebody is interested in. So if you're a wedding photographer, absolutely. If you're a glamour, fashion, product photographer, definitely. There is a lot of, um, you know, uh, business to be done in that genre. But then you have to understand who is the one who is paying for this gig, right? So if you say, I want to go to Bandipur on the weekend and capture pictures of the tiger and come back and I want to be paid well, that's where the problem arises. So in some areas of photography, there are people who need those photographs and they will be willing to pay for it. In some areas of photography, you know, it's not done because there is a need, but it's done because it's a want. In this case, the photographer wants to go to Bandipur, take pictures, enjoy life, enjoy nature, see the tiger, put it on Facebook, get the likes. But then if you expect somebody to pay for it, it's not mature enough, I feel. One important thing to realize about photography is people get paid before they click pictures. You know, after you click pictures, if you want to sell something, it doesn't have too much of value. You can go to any stock photo website and see $5, $3, 300 rupees, 500 rupees is the cost of buying a stock image for your website. So which means there's a huge supply and a very little demand. So if you're pro producing something which has no demand, then your product is not going to get, you know, really a lot of money at all. So it's not lucrative for all genres of photography. But if you know where the money is and you do that kind of photography, you can definitely charge very well for your services. The biggest problem is it's not scalable. And pursuing photography as a passion as well, is it an expensive proposition or somebody can uh, start it on a shoestring, a shoestring budget? Absolutely. Again, uh, the answer depends on the genre of photography. But if you keep that aside, like for example, if you're a wildlife photographer, you would end up putting a lot of money into your hobby. But if you're a street photographer, let's say you go to a, a local market and you photograph the vendors, you photograph people buying early morning, how they clean the streets and all of that, then it may not be financially very taxing on you. You may not even have to spend too much money on vehicles, travel, national park permits, care and all of that. Depends on the genre. But some areas of photography require a lot of investment and it's not possible for everybody to do that. Like going to wildlife destination is definitely not the cheapest of endeavors. And you are on this journey for now a little over 12, 13 years, Jan. How has been the journey? Sorry to cut you. As an entrepreneur, yes, it's my 13th year in business. But as a photographer, it's been a little more than that. What are the moments that you really, really enjoy looking back and any regrets at this point of time? Yeah, yeah. so just for people to understand, I was a techie working in IT industry before. So I'm sure even the worst, you know, situation of being a wildlife photographer is more exciting than being, you know, in front of a computer the whole day. Having said that, I think I do sit in front of the computer a lot. I do a lot of other things apart from just clicking beautiful pictures. I have learned the basics of business on this journey myself. I was absolutely zero when it comes to running a business, knowing even the spelling of entrepreneurship and understanding money, understanding many functions of a business like marketing, sales, operations and stuff like that. So I would say I have had a very expensive MBA in the last 10, 12 years. And uh, I feel I have learned a thing or two after the COVID. It's time for me to get out of college and implement it. That's the feeling I had. Wonderful. It's like the wonderful photographer is also turning out to be an entrepreneur. Honestly, I wanted to be an entrepreneur even in the early stages of my photography, which is why I quit my job. One thing I realized very early is I won't be able to make 
a lot of money and you know lead a good life being just a photographer because as i said it's not scalable i can be in one place at one time and um, i didn't want to depend too much on my own service providing capabilities so i realized i'll build a team i'll you know come up with a company and an offer and a scale and all of that so i think keeping those things in mind i have uh, probably done few things reasonably well and of course a lot of things not well that's an interesting segue to talk about uh, your own organization your own uh, setup giant to hold how did it come into existence what's behind the name what is it like running your own photography organization thank you so to hold basically means it's like a support you know somebody can step on a to hold and climb the mountains and you know all of that that's what is the reason why we called our company to hold initially it was started by four of us who were passionate photographers friends and we realized that we want to you know indulge in doing this regularly and especially a couple of us from the it industry wanted to not have a very different life with respect to economics and financials so we wanted a successful company which will replace our jobs and give us this kind of exciting opportunity but that was the early days after that it has evolved into a reasonably big enterprise with a lot of people who work for the company as i said he probably had the advantage of being one of the first in the country to you know incorporate a company which does these things i don't know anybody else who did something called photo tourism before we did it so i'm i'm sure there must be somebody somewhere but they have done it as an individual probably even now a lot of my competition is individuals than companies so i think um, forming the company and putting a team across and trying to see how we can scale was a good decision on hindsight though we still have a long way to go so as part of to hold you also do classes do expedition tours if you can tell a bit more about it so how can one be part of this absolutely so let me explain what we do at to hold we provide four different kinds of services for our ideal customers the number one being we teach photography because we are excellent photographers ourselves but apart from just knowing how to take pictures i think there's a even more important skill of teaching people how to take good pictures which is what we are good at so we teach people in fact just for records uh, to hold has uh, had the privilege of teaching over 14000 individuals what we call the basics of photography and we used to do this in multiple cities as um, you know workshops over the weekends it's not like an institute with courses it's more of a banquet hall with a weekend workshop because most of our customers are employees of companies and businessmen and doctors and entrepreneurs so they will do it only in their free time so we did workshops in cities like mumbai delhi hyderabad kolkata bangalore mysore chennai and many such places for the last 12 13 years then you know in the covid times we also launched our own app where there is a lot of people from tier 2 tier 3 cities as well who have taken our courses that's the first level of engagement with to hold then we do something called as photo tourism where we take people out on these photo expeditions across the globe in fact we must be the only company who operates tours in more than six continents from the arctic to the antarctic to the far east of russia to the central and northern america and southern america as africa a lot india uh, from you know the himalayas to the you know anomalies in the south we operate tours the nature of these tours is it will be hosted by a photographer like me who we call as the skipper and the person's job is to not just show a place from the perspective of what a photographer can get but also give them instruction guidance fine tune their shots make them overcome their mistakes and change the settings and look at perspectives which they would not if they're going there for the first time so a lot of instructional guidance happens on these tours which is what is called the photo tours we also happen to have a very exhaustive camera rental division at to hold probably the first company in the country to form a company where we provide camera gear for hire to individuals while they were already b2b businesses where they would give a camera to another cameraman who is doing a film or a production or stuff like that but here came a company which would be happy to give you a 3 lakh rupee lens to somebody who is working in some company going to africa for a weekend or a week long tour that was something which we are proud of as we began that's the third business vertical we were in mumbai and pune also before the pandemic but right now we are operating in bangalore and kabini which is also a very capex driven part of my business so i am still wondering how do i scale that part of the business because it simply means we need more money that's the third business vertical the final one being to hold vacations where we simply sit back and plan a holiday send you to the place you want giving all the first hand experience that we have 
to ensure you have a reasonably good experience, uh, not just from a travel agent's perspective, but also from somebody who has been there ourselves, we are probably much more knowledgeable about a place than a travel agent. So that's what is Toehold, four different things we do. Wonderful. We will definitely leave the link of Toehold in the show notes. And it makes me to kind of smile when a photographer talks about things like CapEx, things about the business metrics. So that kind of shows that you have come a long way from just being a wildlife photographer to running a fantastic company that you are, uh, Jayan. Thank you. Uh, just for, you know, I just want to recall, you know, I was not, not at all good in finance. You know, I had no idea. I was a creative guy. My job was to make creative pictures and I would come and say, it's not my job to understand money matters. But then I realized somebody has to learn that, which is also something that I keep telling myself. One of my most overused quote is, uh, you know, if you want to do what you love, you have to love what you do. And which is one of my TED Talks as well. And I really feel I had to actually practice what I'm preaching, which is why I went to IMB to learn basics of money, even from the basics of reading how a balance sheet is understood and stuff like that. So I kind of learned a few things along the way, which was not my core skills at all. And that's a great message in itself for all want to be entrepreneurs who are pursuing their passion projects that there are a lot of these tertiary skills that makes it part and parcel of that project. It's just not your core skill, core competence that is important, but also some of these tertiary skills that helps you to kind of manage, run the business and at some point grow the business. Absolutely. Here comes the first of the power of three round with Giant. Giant, three best places to experience nature. So let's uh, put biodiverse areas which are very different from each other. Number one is the African savanna. Two would be the polar regions, the Arctic and the Antarctic. And number three, maybe the tiger havens of India. So you can see variety of wildlife and experience nature with topographies, trees, landscapes and different things amongst these three places. Nice. Three advice that has helped you to pursue your passion going to be thinking while I answer this. Three advice while pursuing my passion. So number one is passion is uh, not everything. It's just an ingredient to kickstart. You need a lot of other things, like as I said, rationale. But two is if you want to pursue your passion as a business, then you need a lot more business sense than just the amount of passion. Uh, sometimes passion can be a hindrance to actually make something more meaningful because you're so passionate that you're not willing to see the you know uh, negative sides of something as well. So that number two. And um, the third one is there is a time when you will need to realize that when you run a business or an enterprise, it's done for customers. So however passionate you are about something, you will have to do things that the customers want. So the maturity to, you know, treat work like work is something that everybody needs to learn because, you know, in the end, anything you do, there'll be a deadline, there'll be a client, there'll be a paymaster, there'll be negative feedback, there'll be all of those things. So you have to treat work as work, even though it started as a passion, at some point it is going to be a job. Wonderful. You have traveled the length and breadth of the globe. So three best experiences in your travel expedition. Any anecdotes, stories? Sure, sure. Definitely mention first wildlife photography award experience. One, because it was my first, also because it was quite special. It was an elephant in the banks of the Kabini River. I was on a boat and it was, uh, I think in the month of May, an elephant which was very upset with small birds called river terns. When the river turns were kind of attacking the elephant because the elephant was walking on areas where the river turns were nesting, the elephant was already upset. And when it saw my boat approach the island, it started charging my boat. And uh, when it was running towards me with its ear open and the mud splashing against the sunset, I captured a beautiful photograph which not just um, decorated the cover of the Sanctuary magazine, I also won prize in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year contest. So that's definitely something which I should not forget was my first. I also would like to remember a lot of cheetah hunts that I have witnessed and photographed successfully in Africa because that requires just luck. It requires planning, anticipation, camera skills, surety, and all of those things that, you know, I can remember a few instances where we did the right things and uh, anticipated the cheetah's action. So cheetah hunts have been always special. They're so fast that you need to be very good in not just taking right decisions of uh, relocation, positioning and all of that. Also from the camera perspective, you need to be pretty good. Then, of course, the polar regions, as I said, is my favorite. One polar bear sighting that I had in the Arctic, it was about 81 degrees and 39 minutes, if I remember right. 
this bear was you know walking on the sea ice and when it saw our ship it started coming close to us i remember this was a three deck ship quite a big ship 50 people on board i went down two stairs to my lower deck in my cabin to pull out a lens called a fish eye lens i walked back to the upper deck where almost 35 people were photographing this polar bear i happened to use this fish eye lens and capture a picture which uh, not just won me an award but i think it was one of the most spectacular sights for me to see a polar bear against a beautiful you know midnight sun you know 24 hours in the arctic uh, sunlight during the summer a midnight sun with a lovely orange sky and a lot of reflection in the water and the broken ice and the polar bear walking on it kind of a signature shot to describe climate change and global warming i felt and that picture has taken me places so that's probably the third most spectacular sighting for me well, you literally transported me into those uh, places in this last 90 seconds thank you for sharing those moments with us what are three routines that is very unique to jain so since i don the hat of in the cities in the office as well so there are very different things so i think very important uh, for me that i do a lot of creative work from 5:30 in the morning to about 10 o'clock in the morning so this time frame is where i feel i accomplish a lot of work that i cannot do in the whole day because it comes with absolutely no disturbance it's like you know i am buzzing with ideas every morning when i get up from bed and i cannot think of doing anything else even even going to the gym i cannot do it at that hour because that is the hour and the few hours where my brain is working in the most efficient way so 5:30 in the morning till about 10 i am doing creative dreamy prospective futuristic work and i achieve a lot in that time so that is my important time i also when i'm in the jungle of course again because that's the time when i'm very active i'm very active in the early morning late evening hours i'm not at all a night animal at uh, 11 o'clock in the night even on 31st december i hit the sack i spend a lot of time during the weekends learning something which is something i think is important for me i'm always learning something new like for example today i was learning how the chat gpt can take me places <laughs> the last couple of weeks it's been in the news so i learn uh, and embrace technology very fast and i think i use my free time to learn something new all the time so that's pretty much it for the creative person for the photographer for the entrepreneur the key is everyday learning absolutely i think for anybody also shrikant i must mention that since i was a user experience designer i probably sit in this middle ground with between technology and artistry and i feel uh, that's the greatest uh, space to be where i can appreciate you know art at the same time i can have a great pair with the technology so i love to be in that space so this is definitely the next question is very much apt for what you just said which is the three skills that you have picked up while you have pursued this passion of uh, wildlife photography okay one of the skill is definitely to treat photos as art which means that you can shoot less but So here's what I want to tell people. There are two kinds of photos that somebody can make. One of the kinds of photos one one person can make is something what I call a documentary photo. Like for example, let's say you're a journalist and you're supposed to photograph the chief minister coming out of a building. That's kind of a documentary in nature. In wildlife, let's say there's a big cat in Bandipura, we photographed it in this area. Documentary in nature. I learned that if I have to push the monetary benefits of making a photo, I have to push the artistic abilities of myself and make pieces of art rather than just documentary photos because the pieces of art can be sold as fine art prints, can probably win awards, can get you a lot more than making documentation which is of course also sometimes exciting i learned how to use my creativity with the camera people think clicking a picture is itself creative but clicking a creative photo is different from clicking a photo that happens to record what you see is what you get so camera with art blend is my biggest learning and that's what makes me slightly different from many people i speak that's my personal opinion. so there are three this is one any other learning okay okay other learnings with respect to photography yeah so one of the learnings has been that usually when we make some amazing pictures we probably need to sit back and think whether uh, what's the right way or the right right platform or the right moment to showcase that like let's say on the weekend we went to kabini and we got some amazing uh, photograph most people will come back on a monday morning and post it on instagram whereas i learned very early in my photography career that i need to be giving it some time 
and being a little rational because that day I will be very excited. Once I come back and evaluate it, maybe I'll figure out that the right place to show this is in that awards or in this magazine or use this photo for something else, but hold back showing off something without really putting in some thought. So the art of presentation and when to show it, how to show it is something which good photographers learn very soon. Otherwise, everybody comes and just puts it out immediately the next day. So the third thing is probably the lesson on pricing. So I've learned that, you know, while there's no justification for pricing art or artwork or somebody's time as an artist and things like that, there is some kind of logic that you can put to figure out how to price your, you know, uh, work. So um, the confidence to give your work a premium outlook is something which was one of the learnings I had. Otherwise, there are so, so many people who share their work only for credit, whereas I probably have learned how to monetize my work. Oh, terrific lessons out there, Jayan. The last of the power of three round, you always hear about what advice would you give to your younger self? The same version of it, I have a slightly different take on this. What advice would you give for your older self? <laughs> Say, Jayan, so five years from now, no, just one. Mm. Okay. What's your advice to the older self, Jayan, probably five or ten years from now? Okay. Maybe I would tell myself, you know, ten years from now that make up for all the personal pleasures and the family moments that you missed out on uh, while you were chasing dreams. So for the rest of the life, try and see if you can catch up with some of those uh, beautiful moments. Uh, maybe uh, that's what I would tell 52-year-old giant. <laughs> Wonderful. Anything else you would want to tell the 50-year-old giant? Yeah, I, I would have liked to put a little more effort to, you know, take care of my body is what I would probably felt that I should have you know, given more attention to health and fitness and all of that. There's still time. Uh, I have 10 years to get there. But I think that's one area where I can work on myself much better. Fantastic. Jayant, thanks for being a sport and participating in this Power of Free round. So we are coming along well. We did talk a lot about wildlife photography. And there is a large question looming large at all of us, just not photographers, but the citizens of this world. It's about the man-animal conflict, right? We, you have taken some breathtaking pictures, but the man-animal conflict or the climate crisis is looming as being so close to the wilderness yourself. What have you observed, experienced and captured through your lenses? Right. So one of the hidden agendas of what I do is I consider myself a nature awareness campaigner. I am not into wildlife conservation because I feel to call myself that I need to be a lot more knowledgeable with, you know, a lot of other things, not just about wildlife, but also from the uh, human side of the story. But I think role as a wildlife photographer is to bring back a lot of beautiful stories and pictures. And I feel people like me, they do a very important job of exciting a lot of common man, giving them, you know, a lot of reasons to like something. And once you like and fall in love with something, then you start introducing the problems of these to common man. In other words, let's say if you don't love polar bears and tigers and, you know, all of that. And if you say the Bangalore Mysore Highway uh, has a problem with leopards crossing the road, if you don't empathize, if you don't feel for that leopard, if you don't love that leopard, you will not really make decisions in favor of them. So I think the first thing people like me have to do is showcase the beauty of this world. And once people are at a stage where they are willing to see a lot more, we need to slip a small issue or two and educate the people as well. So I think we are headed in the right direction compared to what it was 25 years ago. Hundreds and hundreds of nature lovers in this country from kids talking about exotic species of wildlife to all these words like climate change and you know global warming and all becoming you know, words that feature in daily conversations, I think we are doing very well. In about 10-15 years, while the world deteriorates, I feel the human consciousness also will improve a lot more. And I think that's when we'll be in a stage where we can repair a lot of things that we screwed up. Last week, I partnered with a, you know, computer company who uh, launched a laptop, which was made out of reusable plastic. So I was the brand ambassador for that and I showcased how reusing plastic, you know, in fact, it's already there that, you know, you cannot get it out of this world. At least stop making new 
and reuse that plastic was the perspective of a global technology giant. Now, a person like me is the bridge between a global company like that and the common man. And a lot of people who saw this promo started replying saying, I'm amazing to see such a company come up with a product like this. I would like to buy this product myself. So which tells me that big corporations are talking about, you know, pollution, plastic, climate change, global warming. And the audience is saying, okay, when I buy my next laptop, I will consider that, which shows that the connection is getting, you know, it's meeting each other. And that's the ideal world where companies make what people want and people want what should be the right thing in this planet. And uh, somewhere people like us play the role of bridging this gap, I feel. Absolutely. I think awareness followed by action is what is the need of the art. Making it stick. Your actionable insights from today's conversation. Take it, implement it and see the difference. Hi, I'm Sanchita and I'm back to share some actionable insights from today's episode with Jen. He shared the clarity he has in what he does, from enjoying the moment to using photography for others. His belief that passion is the fuel to kickstart a new idea, but there are many factors at play to sustain it. Let me share what stood out for me from the conversation. When he clicks a good photograph, he doesn't immediately jump into sharing or showing off on platforms on the kill he made. And he advises that it is important to hold back the excitement to do so, think about the right platform, right presentation, and the right time to share to achieve a certain objective. What an excellent advice. He is talking about delayed gratification versus instant gratification. A thought-through plan to share a photograph for appreciation or recognition versus immediate appreciation for photography. Instant or immediate gratification is a term that refers to the temptation to forego a future benefit in order to obtain a less rewarding but more immediate benefit. It's a natural human urge to want good things and to want them now. The flip side, however, of instant gratification is delayed gratification or what we call the decision to put off satisfying your desire to gain an even better reward or benefit in the future. Now, it's uh, easy to see how delayed gratification is generally the wiser behavior, but we still struggle on a daily basis with the temptation to give in to our immediate desire. Now, there was this research from Princeton University. Uh, where they said that there are two areas of the brain, one that is associated with our emotions and the other with abstract reasoning. As you might have guessed, the emotional part of our brain responds positively to instant gratification. And the emotion and the logic-based parts of our brains are constantly in a battle, trying to show you why you should choose one option and not the other. The researchers therefore concluded that impulsive choices happen when the emotional part of our brains triumphs over the logical one. We are now accustomed to getting what we want when we want it and technology and social media are two big reasons for this trend. When you have essentially the world at your fingertips, it's extremely challenging to consciously choose delayed gratification over instant. Saying no to immediate gratification is not easy. But let me suggest you two ways to manage that. Firstly, pre-commit. In order to protect yourself from the temptation of instant gratification, is to make some decisions beforehand. So if you can set some of your most important decisions in stone now, you will be less likely to change your mind and go through the hassle of backtracking when you actually come to face that decision. Secondly, tie emotions to your goals. Our emotions are easily can overpower any logic deduction skills we have. So if you really want to start creating habit, then associate it with an emotion. For instance, perhaps when Jan puts off the idea of sharing, he reminds himself of the positive rewards like an award, future collaborations, financial payout, etc. that he'll experience when he shares the photograph at the right platform at the right time. It is all about finding simple cues on a day-to-day basis to get your brain to cooperate and behave according to your goals. The more we learn how to see long-term goals as beneficial over the desires of instant gratification, it can really help contribute to a healthier, 
and a happier world. Jet, it's been fantastic having conversation with you, your expeditions, and what you have done in this field of uh, wildlife photography. Wishing you continued success. Before we sign off, this show is all about creating ripples of inspiration. Well, I think uh, this planet is amazing. It's so beautiful. It's still not completely explored. There's a lot of stories to tell. I think everybody who has a phone is a photographer. I would love to see a lot more people uh, becoming wildlife savvy. understanding nature better It starts from you know uh, even even a simple thing of uh, calling a cheetah a cheetah and a leopard a leopard and not saying there was cheetah in my city kind of a thing so i want people to get a lot more aware fall in love with nature use your technology cameras your youtubes your blogs your instagrams and showcase the beauty of this world create more awareness and maybe contribute towards saving this planet to all uh, people who are excited about some endeavor of life they're passionate they're creative so i think let's say photography for example because i am a photographer it makes sense while you buy a camera and you're excited about it you're passionate about it my my suggestion would be to not get passionate about the tool you're using my suggestion would be to realize that this tool's job is to just express what you're feeling what you're going through so make a camera not your object of passion but a tool of your expression so that is something that i would like people to understand sooner than they realize it takes time for people to realize that that's why i keep saying the camera itself is not my passion the photography itself is not my passion the field where you use your camera should be where your passion lies and then you can tell stories that are much more mature and artistic and reach far so don't get um, too engrossed in the tools that you're using they are mere tools it's like an author will never talk about the brand of pen or the kind of uh, pen they're using because it's not about the pen it's about the thoughts creativity ideas and all of that so start using your camera as just a tool to express yourself then you'll start focusing on your area of interest your passion your subjects and all of that picture is worth worth a thousand words that's what jayant is alluding here everybody is a photographer in this world where everybody has their mobile phones let's use it for the positivity of the world let's use it to spread the message of anything that changes the perspective of this world on that note jayan thank you so much for taking time and sharing your experiences with us right message out there it reminds me of the saying pen is mightier than sword where pen is just a means of what you want to translate to the world the same is the case if you have camera in your hand look at the possibilities of what you can do how you can change the world around you Thank you for listening into today's edition of Inspire Someone today. It's been a privilege to bring in these conversations. If you like this episode and have any feedback or comments, do mail me at inspire someone today podcast at the rate gmail dot com. Inspiring someone is like creating ripples around us. If you like what you listen, feel free to share them and let's create ripples of inspiration. Do not forget to follow me on my Instagram handle. at the rate inspire someone today podcast for all the latest updates this is shrikant your host signing off and until next time keep inspiring